Turner Broadcasting System. We'll talk with the mother of the late Heather O'Rourke about the death of the child actress. We'll meet some Hollywood personalities who've overcome their disabilities and shine like stars. REO Speedwagon hits the record bins again with a greatest hits album. And we'll take a look back at some of your favorite TV game shows. At the top of the showbiz headlines, some critics charged that American television networks are not doing a good enough job covering South Africa. Filling in this void, reports Charles Feldman, is a new program about South Africa that is independently produced and which uses the talents of many network producers who are working on the project anonymously. South Africa Now is a half-hour show that, say its creators, is designed to fill in what they say is a critical gap in American TV coverage of South Africa. This is the story of our time, the story of the century, the story of the majority of South African people, both black and white, who are struggling to be free. And to devote, if you will, a minute, a minute 30 of spot news in the United States is simply not sufficient. ABC News producer Danny Schechter agrees. He's written extensively on the subject. If something dramatic happens, it tends to get covered. But a lot of the stories are not dramatic. Children in detention, you don't see them. They're there. They're being tortured every day. In this clip from South Africa Now, a child tells of alleged police torture in South Africa. While South Africa does have severe press restrictions, former CBS political director Richard Cohn contends the real problem is self-censorship. I think that journalists in South Africa today have come down with a, uh, a horrible case of timidity. I think that uh, the press is obsessed with its view of itself as an endangered species. I think the press is backing away from any confrontation with the government. They think they're going to get thrown out. They're afraid they're going to have to leave. And consequently, I think they've almost forgotten why they're there in the first place. Since the invention of photojournalism, uh, uh, photojournalists have risked their lives. And currently, the American networks, ours included, are in harm's way in dozens of places across the world where shots are being fired in anger. Uh, so it is terribly unfair to say or to indicate or hint in any manner or form that it is from uh, lack of, of courage that we are not in South Africa. South Africa Now, which gets help from many network producers who prefer to remain anonymous, is expanding and is already available in over 100 American TV markets. Charles Feldman, CNN, New York. In other showbiz news, as Poltergeist 3 opens around the country, the memory of Heather O'Rourke continues to make headlines. The mother of the star of the three Poltergeist movies has filed a wrongful death suit against the hospital and medical group that treated Heather. They're back. Heather O'Rourke sadly won't be back. Seven months after she finished filming Poltergeist 3, the child star was struck with flu-like symptoms that became very severe. She was being treated for inflammation of the bowel, and as her condition deteriorated, her mother called an ambulance. She said she loved me, and then she suffered cardiac arrest in the ambulance. And then they operated on her after they were stable, and um, they told me she had a, a congenital blocked intestine and had died of septic shock. Mm -hmm. And the next day, that's when I got to thinking, well, this isn't what she had. What they thought she had was a, a bowel uh, inflammation. What she actually had was an obstruction. And the difference is they were treating her medically with uh, uh, drugs, whereas, in fact, what they should have done uh, almost a year before her death was to operate and remove this uh, narrowed uh, portion of the bowel. And that's a fairly routine procedure, and had that been done, uh, I, I've been told that she would have been fine and led a normal life. A spokesman for the Kaiser Foundation Hospital, one of the main defendants in the wrongful death suit, has said the diagnosis and treatment was correct. Bill? With the death of Heather O'Rourke and several other stars in the Poltergeist film, supermarket tabloids immediately began running stories of the films being jinxed. Zelda Rubenstein is in Poltergeist 3, playing her now familiar role of the clairvoyant. When we sat down to talk with her, we asked what she thought of the Jinx stories. I owe it to Heather to present her case as most honestly and lovingly as I can. I loved this child very much. 
and I am still very grieved at her passing. Uh, Heather died uh, because of an undetected uh, con congenital anatomical defect. Uh, Julian Beck died from cancer in his mature years. Will Sampson passed away after receiving a heart-lung transplant. It's my understanding he had an environmental disease. And Dominic Dunn died at the hands of, of a, an extremely ill-directed, passionate boyfriend. Uh, these are reasons. I do not call this a jinx. So uh, I think that it's pretty much a courtesy to put to an end this uh, superstitious um, crap. There were also stories published that during filming, scripts would mysteriously vanish and objects would fly around the set. No, I've never had any experiences like that. Okay. No, I think it's hype. The objects we do see fly around can be credited to special effects people. And of course, some chills are courtesy of Zelda as Tangina. Can I? A character Zelda Rubinstein hopes to continue playing, even, sadly to say, without Heather O'Rourke. I believe that there's room for more. And a lot will de depend on the public demand. Coming up on Showbiz Today, come on down to a look at some of your favorite TV game shows. Tomorrow, we'll talk with actor Roy Sharkey about the hit series Wise Guy. And later this week, we'll chat with sexy Susan Sarandon about the film Bull John. Showbiz Today brings you the latest entertainment news. Stay with us. And now back to Showbiz Today on CNN. In the latest Nielsen ratings, Dan Rather is back on top in evening news after six weeks with Peter Jennings in the lead. Here's what's on top in prime time. Cheers is on top in the latest Nielsen ratings. A different world takes the number two slot. The Cosby Show, airing while the sun is still shining this time of year, is down in third place. Night Court is fourth. The CBS Sunday night movie, That Secret Sunday, rounds out the top five. For the week, NBC leads with an 11.8 average rating. CBS was second with a 10.9. And ABC third with a 9.3. Add those figures up and you get 32, which means fewer than one in three TV households were watching the big three entertainment networks during an average primetime minute. Bill? There is no more durable form of television than the game show. They were among the most popular programs in TV's early years, and some of the same games with minor alterations remain on the air today. Sandy Kenyon talked to the author of a new book on the subject. Come on down! The most famous three words in game show history also serve as the title of a new book about the genre. Game shows are, are another world unto themselves and uh, they really don't change that much. You know, the, 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 the game always remains the same. Never was the old saying more true that everything old is new again. They are recycled so many times because it's hard to come up with a new game and because more people are, are apt to tune in to a show that has a familiar title. Let's make a deal. Queen for an A. game shows were based on familiar parlor games and they still are today wheel of fortune is nothing more than hangman with props and a beautiful woman at this point they've all been done so you know they've got people in hollywood who are scratching their heads out every day trying to devise some new twist on it the game is always the star here and no one knows that better than veteran host Alex Trebek. You do not sit at home and watch these shows uh, in a passive manner. You actively participate. You sit on the edge of your seat and you want to get in there. And as soon as a clue is revealed, you shout out a response. Inevitably, some who do well at home want to participate in person. If you want to be on a game show, A, practice, watch the show every day, videotape the program, and study. And if you find that you can play the game well, and can beat the contestant on TV or be just as good as, as that person, you're probably going to do pretty well in the contestant audition. For those who do well, there remains a final pitfall, the Internal Revenue Service, because the value of the stuff you win is taxed 
just as if you took it home in cash. Sandy Kenyon, CNN, Hollywood. What's in a name? Well, in the movie business, a name can sometimes make the difference between a hit and a flop. Dennis Michael looks at the art and science of movie titles. Off Limits was shot under the title Saigon. The original name for Shakedown was Blue Jean Cop. Skip Tracer became The Squeeze. With millions of dollars at stake, tinkering with movie titles is common. I think the key to naming, whether it be a product, whether it be a company, or whether it be a movie title, one of the keys is differentiation. It's the ability to create a name that gets you away from everybody else. Some movies are violating that rule this year. Big has become a big word at the box office with big, big business, big top peewee. The great outdoors started its life as big country, and big business nearly arrived with a different name as well. Things like uh, double trouble and funny business and uh, every other adjective in front of business that one could think that you might want to uh, have a comedy with, and none of them sounded right or uh, distinctive enough or interesting enough. Red Heat is a title that's distinctive and interesting. Great name. It's active. It sounds sensual. Um, it's got a play on, on, towards the movie, actually. I mean, Red being communist and Heat being police. But after Red Heat and Dead Heat, the makers of Outer Heat decided it was too much of a hot thing and changed their film's name to Alienation. A title can get credit for a hit. Fatal Attraction was nearly released with the title Diversions. I think we'll look back on Fatal Attraction many, many years to come and say, gosh, that was a great name. That's exactly what the movie's all about. However, a new title can't save a movie that's doomed to failure. Blind Camel was retitled Ishtar and still lost a fortune. A rose by any other name would smell as sweet, but this summer, don't name your movie Big Heat. Dennis Michael, CNN, Hollywood. Still to come on Showbiz Today, veteran rockers REO Speedwagon put out a greatest hits album. Tomorrow, we'll talk with Arnold Schwarzenegger about the movie Red Heat with Jim Belushi. And later this week, the Rascals are back in action. There's more showbiz today still to come right after these words from our sponsors. Wake up to what's been happening while you've been sleeping with CNN's Daybreak and Daywatch. Weekdays on CNN. New on the music scene, REO Speedwagon offers an album of their greatest hits from the past two decades. But band members Kevin Cronin and Bruce Hall are not resting with the album's release. Both are banding together with a few friends in a local L.A. night spot. Sherry Sylvester has more. The sound of REO Speedwagon is characterized by the ballads of Kevin Cronin. Songs from the heart of personal pain and the experiences of life. Here with me is their latest. It's my But Cronin cares for more than the sound that has kept his speed wagon in full gear for nearly 20 years. He also likes a little brass, a little soul, and the thrill of some back-to-basics jamming. We've kind of, you know, sadly learned that, uh, that, that the 